Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot of uh, material to go over. I'm Andy Mulinair. I'm the Section Chief of Pediatric Pulmonology uh, here at Columbia Children's. And today we're going to talk a little bit about global health. Um, as a group, we have no conflicts of interest. And our objectives today are to uh, try to relate what team science and transdisciplinary research, uh, how they uh, are relevant to global health activities. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about community-based participatory research in clinical practice, um, how we can apply principles of health behavior therapy theory to your current work setting, then um, how we can uh, apply some of these globally uh, global scenarios to local and regional challenges. Hopefully you'll see this all weave together. We have four speakers um, in the spirit of transdisciplinary research and team science. So in uh, January 2013, uh, I had the uh, privilege of uh, doing a needs assessment in um, Malawi for the Coca-Cola Africa Foundation. I was going from hospital to hospital, uh, talking to uh, physicians, uh, nurses, administrators, as part of a large donation program through a group in Atlanta that does medical equipment and supplies, and uh, a group that I worked with, uh, City Hope International, who uh, arranged for donations of pharmaceuticals. And I had the uh, uh, opportunity to spend some time with Charles Wensambo, the uh, head of the Ministry of Health in Malawi, and I asked Charles uh, what was the greatest challenge he had as the um, uh, the head of all the healthcare in a country, and he immediately responded, "Human resources." The next morning, I was on uh, on a uh, I call, it was uh, 6 a.m. there in midnight here, and my wife Penny, who you will meet in a little bit, uh, uh, on that phone call kind of uh, reminded me that uh, I could run all over Africa offering uh, up drugs, but without appropriate and hygiene, I was kind of wasting Coca-Cola's money. signed into that. It's calling you. Talk to... Uh, Jim McGill, who's a friend of ours, he's, he's a, uh, an engineer in water and sanitation, uh, but he, he's also a missionary with the Presbyterian Church. So uh, about 20 minutes later, I ran into Jim in a parking lot of the hotel, kind of uh, accidentally. Jim invited me to come to Masuzu University in the north and visit uh, the Center of Excellence in Water and Sanitation. And um, as I went around with Jim, and he was showing me how they were working on devices for uh, filtering water, uh, different kinds of pumps uh, for wells, and in the upper right-hand side, that's a, uh, a drill bit for a percussion drill for drilling for water. And uh, based on some experiences I'd had at Virginia Tech working with uh, engineers, I asked the, uh, the simple question, Jim, if I can figure out how to get them here, would you host some engineering students this summer? And the immediate answer was yes, and we, we did it. Um, but during that trip, kind of the, the aha moment for me was uh, riding along the, in the countryside in Malawi and uh, really coming to the realization that in the short term, we can't create more human resources, but we certainly can think about how we can uh, create devices or enhance processes to uh, enable uh, those who are already working there to be more efficient. And again, without adequate water sanitation hygiene, uh, a lot of what we do in international, international relief uh, is wasted. And so uh, we need to address clean water as a basic human right. So um, going to the dentist, you in uh, 2013, someone uh, is on the line. You need to mute your phone at home. So it'll be clean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, good for you. So, so in 2013, and we'll talk about this later. Um, we collaborated with Rochelle Holmes. She is an environmental scientist. Uh, she's an American. 
working at Masuzu University, and um, Penny uh, performed her uh, MPH Capstan project at Masuzu University, and we sent uh, two mechanical engineering students to perform the need assess needs assessment that evolved into their senior design project, and um, and Penny completed her, her MPH, and she's going to talk about that work and, and how it relates to community-based uh, participatory research. And our engineering students came up with a neonatal reconstruction that they call global air. Uh, air is assisted infant resuscitation. That's another whole talk. So um, the next year, um, I went with Penny and three students, and we carried the global air device along with other devices we've been working on um, in mechanical engineering related to um, uh, global health. And we, um, we kind of went to, we went to eight hospitals. We talked to hey, hey. different uh, providers about these devices and did a lot of relationship building. I'm going to pause you, Dr. Miller. We have several people who are uh, on the phone, I think, who just joined us. If you would please mute your lines. They are all unmuted since we're doing some remote presentations today. So we have, we have uh, lots of conversations that we can hear in a room full of our, our guests here today. So please just mute your phone, uh, and we can continue the presentation. Thank you. So we did some relationship uh, uh, building. Uh, here on the right, I wanted to point out that uh, Dr. J. Joe's son, Nick, uh, did one of the posters that uh, you can see hung on the side of this, uh, this house in, in a village. Um, and this is all part of community-based participatory research and design. <clears throat> so um, we've been doing a lot of work in, in Africa. In, in September 2015, we realized that we had a lot of people in this region working in Malawi. We had um, a group from Radford University and Virginia Tech uh, Education carrying students there every year for about the, the last 10 years, uh, working in rural schools and teaching teachers how to teach and teaching these young students how to teach. Um, we, uh, we had the, uh, the program that we took the students uh, with the first two years we called Scioneering in Malawi. It was part of a program at Virginia Tech. Um, we had senior design projects in mechanical engineering, uh, City Hope International, the group that I worked with, um, and, uh, and then we had local uh, faith-based groups including Blacksburg and Covenant Presbyterian churches uh, in this area who had been supporting uh, hospitals and schools uh, in the area. Um, along the way, Penny uh, convinced uh, the professor of her water and sanitation course at Virginia Tech to uh, stop using theoretic um, examples um, for homework assignments, uh, you know, like figuring out how, how, uh, how much water you need uh, to catch off the roof of a hospital in Haiti in order to provide um, enough water for all the patients for a year and things like that. So, uh, Professor Ralph Hall uh, mobilized and went to Malawi and taught a graduate course where he matched uh, grad students from the United States with graduate students from Malawi, and that was quite uh, successful. And then we had Je Josiah Tulu, who is a retired professor emeritus at Virginia Tech. He's from Zimbabwe, but had worked in Malawi, and he had um, uh, written grants and promoted uh, having Malawian um, uh, education students come to Virginia Tech for their uh, PhDs in education. And also, um, he, uh, he worked with another group that had uh, students coming for their MPHs at Virginia Tech. So, um, Team Malawi was uh, generated, and it's a transdisciplinary collaboration. We based it on a community wellness model of health uh, designed to meet the challenges in a low resource environment through community-based participatory research design, and we put in pedagogy, which I had to look that up, it's educate, really education type research. Um, and our, uh, our vision was to use a community wellness model uh, or disease management model as a framework 
to integrate the activities of a lot of different uh, folks from a lot of different uh, specialties. Our primary goal is student engagement to foster global perspectives for students, stimulate ideas for improving conditions, that these would be sustainable, and that we certainly encourage uh, evidence-based uh, scholarly research. So the community wellness model is pretty simple. Um, screen for disease, diagnose disease, treat disease, prevent disease, and education is central to all of this with prevention obviously being the, uh, uh, the best way to do this. Um, our approach, the community-based participatory research uh, uh, method, uh, Dr. Kathy Hosig is going to talk about that in a little bit. So uh, all this to say that it's a cyclical process. We've been back and forth with some of these devices and processes on a number of occasions. It's based on what the community feels they need, and it is quite amenable to uh, participatory research by our students and faculty and for service learning. Um, for those of you who weren't here in July, uh, I, I talked about team research, um, uh, team science and transdisciplinary research, and I really feel like um, what, uh, what we're doing with Team Malawi uh, fits within uh, this model. Um, we, uh, we are looking at societies, uh, taking that worldview, and certainly including the stakeholders. I might mention that we started with 11 of us who met and decided to put this together. Uh, we now, typically our meetings are 50 or more people, and we have over 100 participants, including a student group that has been started at Virginia Tech with, uh, with a focus on Malawi as well. Um, 2016, we started with our um, uh, real projects uh, under the Team Malawi umbrella. Uh, the teaching and learning in Malawi, we sent engineering students with the teaching students, uh, education students. And uh, this, uh, this young lady here is a second year student at Virginia Tech Carillion uh, uh, School of Medicine. That's Lauren Cashman. Lauren uh, did her undergrad degree in biological systems engineering at Virginia Tech and then stuck around uh, for a gap year. She decided to go ahead and get a master's in uh, mechanical engineering. So she is, um, she is there demonstrating a little device that we put together to um, monitor temperature in babies at risk for hypothermia uh, in the malnutrition ward. She went to the hospital, mapped out uh, how these little devices could communicate to a single Android device, and received a lot of feedback about um, uh, the device itself from the uh, end users uh, but also continued to develop relationships with some entrepreneur, young entrepreneurs in Malawi, um, met with uh, the folks at the Ministry of Health, and uh, visited other hospitals as well. Uh, this uh, image on the lower right, um, the, uh, the, the gentleman standing next to Lauren is um, Jones Masia. He got his MPH from um, uh, Virginia Tech, he works at the Ministry of Health and was assigned um, as our liaison for any of our activities uh, in the country. Experience WASH was uh, that course that uh, I mentioned. It had, uh, you know, the students, faculty, uh, they were there, uh, some for four weeks, others for six weeks doing service projects. But uh, the collaborations were among engineering, public health, education, the med school. Uh, several small businesses, international uh, non-governmental organizations, and the Department of Urban Affairs and Planning at Virginia Tech. So uh, our, our activities have been transdisciplinary, community-based, student-oriented. You see Lauren uh, there on the upper left, and Ashley Taylor is another one of our grad students with uh, Penny and Jessica Topp, one of our former faculty here. Uh, everybody working together, everybody moving in the same direction. We've established collaborations with Masuzu University, the University of Malawi Polytechnic, and the uh, School of Medicine, and most recently the Malawi University for Science and Technology. Our reach has expanded. We now have uh, a group, Team Haiti, you'll hear a little bit about later, 
and Team Uganda with the same principles, <coughs> different, different players in different countries. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Penny. Good morning. I'm Penny Millier. I'm a pediatrician, infectious disease specialist, and um, I recently <coughs> completed my MPH um, in public health education at Virginia Tech. And Dr. Hosick, who you'll meet in a moment, is, uh, was one of my faculty um, professors and advisors. Um, and she will be talking about community-based participatory research. This understanding and improving water sanitation practices to improve health outcomes in Malawi was my capstone project for my MPH. I actually did not have a lot of background in uh, water and sanitation, but as I worked just seeing patients there initially starting in 2004, I've been going to Malawi since 2004, and I've been there about 15 times. Um, I've been able to um, evolve um, from just individual patient care to looking at what can we do in terms of prevention, uh, which I think will have a greater impact on the people. Um, I wanted to just illustrate in water sanitation and hygiene, one of the things you want is clean, potable water. I don't know if you all know what that um, device is. <coughs> that little um, bed is, but that's a cholera bed, and that's what a person who has cholera would have to lay on um, because of the um, massive amount of uh, diarrhea. They have to uh, use a bed like that because it's sort of uncontrollable. And what we're trying to do is prevent cholera. Um, Malawi is a landlocked country in Southeast Africa. Uh, when I had this slide uh, the day before yesterday, I thought, well, I better update it. It was dated 2004. Uh, 15, and there were 16.3 million people. It's now 19.1. The GDP per capita, and this GDP means it's, it's been adjusted at its services in Malawi, is about $1,095 per year. 50% um, of the people live below the poverty line, and extreme poverty is 25%. Um, life expectancy has increased some because of the implementation of antiretroviral meds for HIV AIDS, which had really markedly, markedly lowered the uh, life expectancy. Um, and it, the uh, life expectancy is now around 61 to 63 or 40 years. In rural um, locations on small land, honing, land holdings, and they are basically um, okay. Dr. Mueller, let me stop you for a second. <laughs> okay. Again, we've had um, a couple people uh, since our last uh, announcements. All of our phones are unmuted today since we have some remote presenters. So if you're just joining us, please mute your personal phone because we can hear your conversations and your typing and all kinds of stuff. So please just uh, mute your phones now. Thank you. Okay. The high popul population growth rate has eroded the gain made from economic growth, and it's led to high levels of poverty. A lot of the challenges are related to limited no. access to water. Like three percent of water piped into their homes. Poor hygiene practices and their risk perception is low. But uh, partially Africa. Very urban areas, which is where I conducted my um, study, which was Area 1B in Mizuzu, a city in northern Malawi. It's an unplanned community, usually sprawls on the edge of an urban city, and um, there's a lot of population density. They're often not acknowledged by the local government, and so there's a high risk for contamination of drinking water and waterborne infectious disease. They work on that clean water for those. Uh, please, again, please mute your phone. We have one person who is still talking over our presenter, so please mute your phone now. Thank you. Um, the purpose of my research was to understand the baseline practices and knowledge of the people in this community related to their water supplies, safety of their drinking water, hygiene, hygiene and sanitation. It, uh, my project was actually comparing the efficacy and acceptance of three different water purification methods that we used as an intervention. Um, for sustainable interventions, you need to have a knowledge of the efficacy of the intervention, like comparing the three methods, but you also need to know 
is it accepted by the end user? In order to maintain a behavior, it's got to be accepted by the local population, and that can be a challenge. Um, Ash, uh, uh, let, uh, Kathy Postig will talk about community history research in more detail. And this project is illustrating some of those principles. We tried to engage all the stakeholders in the community. We partnered for the, with Mizzou University Center for Excellence in Water and Sanitation and the SMART Center at Mizzou University. We worked with local water and sanitation providers, <coughs> like dug wells, built pit latrines, and so forth. And a local t teacher uh, in the nearby school facilitated communication with the head man of this region. And this man here and his wife were very instrumental in our success. We got approval of the head man before we went into the community. And his wife was really good at engaging the people. Um, the head man's wife uh, gathered people when we would have um, um, distribution of the uh, water purification method and also helped us with uh, a follow-up the following year, gathering the same people together. Um, a local vendor provided education about these uh, methods. He sold tulip filters, and he had been a teacher, and so he was very good at um, educating about water purification and use of this tabletop tulip filter, which you'll see in a moment. We also used water guard, which is a chlorine uh, to purify water, and we boiled water. So those were the three methods. Um, so this is the uh, teacher and um, sort of local entrepreneur who sold this tabletop tulip filter. It was a um, ceramic uh, filter that is impregnated with silver. Some of them have carbon cores. This one did not. Um, so that was one method. We also had them boil water. This is wood that's used for boiling and the typical little fire over which they can boil their water. And this is the water guard for chlorination. Uh, our population, as I mentioned, was Area 1B uh, in Mizuzu. Um, the homes there had not been enrolled in a study uh, prior to this. And their water sources were hand-dug shallow wells, borehole wells, and municipal taps that were shared among several households. We gave a structured household questionnaire that had 89 questions. It was based on a WHO uh, drinking water and sanitation questionnaire and a Water for People Field Level Operations Watch Project. It was reviewed and had been um, tested prior to this. Uh, there were sections on water sources, sanitation, health, what kind of, how much water they consumed, and what the safety was. We did a follow-up questionnaire that we was validated, uh, modeled on a study in Tanzania. The questions were adapted for the current study, and it was about 25 questions, and it mainly looked at acceptance of the method. Uh, we randomly assigned 30 households to one of the three methods. We did a live group demonstration here, and um, on the day of the education, we distributed the um, water purification methods to the households. Uh, we did follow-up visits at one or two weeks. We did water cultures and asked whether they were using the method and if they had any problems. Um, we tested the drinking water, and this is just a Hawk M. coli blue method that created a culture plate. It was quite challenging, but we created a culture plate, and blue colonies were E. coli, and red colonies were uh, other coliforms. So a combination of the two were total coliforms. Um, we used WHO guidelines for water quality and uh, categorize the level of E. coli in the water, which is fecal contamination. And uh, any fecal contamination is considered um, inappropriate for drinking. Um, our data was analyzed for fecal contamination using the standard marker um, and the culture. Um, guidelines are this. Um, low levels of risk are associated with one colony unit, intermediate with 10 to 100, high, 100 to 1,000 or more, and uh, we did have some challenges when the incubator failed and um, which was run by a car battery because the other battery was not working, and we would have to carry it to car garage to recharge it on a bicycle, <laughs> so it was a challenge. Um, these were the results of uh, the tulip filter. 
it really had the best outcome. There was only um, one household that did not conform to the uh, um, standard of zero colonies. Uh, of col uh, zero colonies. Uh, so the water was um, um, very uh, um, pure using the tulip filter. It was also well accepted. They liked having it in their household. Water guard is chlorine. They don't like the taste of chlorine in their water. They're used to drinking natural water. And sometimes, then, although the woman is often in charge of water in the household, retrieving it, storing it in containers in the household, uh, sometimes the father would say, I don't like this. You're not going to use the chlorine. So that became a problem. And so there was uh, some um, problems with, um, there was much more contamination in the chlorinated water. But the nice thing about chlorine is that there is a, a protective factor of the chlorine remaining in the water for like 24 hours after it's been there. That's the challenge with boiling water. Once you boil it, it's clean for that period of time, but it can immediately become contaminated. So we had some of the highest levels of contamination in water that was boiled. They also don't like the taste because if it's boiled over a fire, it doesn't taste good. Um, so this, this is just showing the tulip filter uh, had only a low level of contamination. Um, the uh, boiling water had the highest level of contamination. Um, and the uh, water guard was pretty good, uh, but did not um, compare to the tulip filter. And I think the water guard drawback is the taste of the water. Um, we did an analysis, and it didn't quite reach uh, significance. I think if we had more households in the study, and um, we did include the households, like that one household discontinued use of the tulip filter because the wife went away and the husband didn't filter the water, but it was included in the tulip filter group. Um, so I think if we could go back and do a larger study, I think it would be significant. Um, so no household using the tulip filter or water guard had E. coli levels in moderate or high range. The moder majority of households using them conformed to the WHO standard for clean drinking water. Um, three out of 10 households that boiled their water had high health risk range of uh, contamination. Um, and a minority of households that boiled their water conformed to the WHO standard of zero colony. Um, we did correlate the questionnaires. I'm not gonna go into this. You can look at it later. Um, and the, we just went back and looked at the questionnaires for individual households to see why they might have had contamination. And some of those reasons that I just mentioned are why they had levels of contamination that were problematic. So in conclusion, we wanted to gain an understanding and knowledge about household water sources, their quality, what practices they were using, and their understanding of uh, water uh, safety and how it might be making them sick if they are not using clean water sources, and we gained that through our baseline surveys and observations. Um, and then we looked at the efficacy of the three methods and how well it was accepted by the household. Um, water guard and tulip filter were superior. Um, the tabletop tulip filter is an effective way to purify water. It's well accepted, and um, the, uh, it's protected from ongoing contamination because of the covering uh, lid. Some of the problems are households often store their water in open containers. Children can put their hands in it, um, and uh, it can get contaminated once it's in the household, even if it starts out clean. The, pro the difficulty with the tulip filter is it costs $15, uh, and every uh, six months you have to get a replacement um, ceramic filter. Uh, that It would be possible to develop a, a health program to introduce this and provide perhaps a small loan so that they can pay for it over time, would mainly need to convince them to prioritize clean water in their household. Water guard with unpleasant taste. You just put a cap full in a 20 liter bucket of water to purify water that has to <coughs> sit there for 30 minutes. And boiling water is I mentioned is easily contaminated. Um, in conclusion, we used our data to develop a plan for a public health education program in 2014 to promote the use of the point of use water purification method in the home and to improve household sanitation and raise awareness and their risk perception um, and improve hygiene practices 
uh, to promote health. We um, strategies for education would include health communication, health education peer to peer, and environmental changes to promote health. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a potential for a loan program. And this is when we went back the following year and did a uh, uh, that's Laura J. Joe's son's poster on the bottom there. Uh, but we had other students making posters that they brought. Um, they designed them and brought them as part of their uh, coursework. And that was just me going back and going over, number one, we went individually over the results of the studies with each household. That was very important going back and letting them know what the outcomes of the study were, not just doing the study and never showing up again, and then um, educating them about the outcomes. I'm not going to go over the challenges. They were multiple. We didn't have very much money. We walked into the community, challenges with the lab and so forth. But um, we did, uh, this was our sort of uh, sustaining uh, quote was, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. I overheard that on our radio many years ago in Malawi. And it's really true. People working together can do a lot more. So I think Kathy Hosig is next. And, um, She's on the faculty at Virginia Tech. She's in the MPH program, wonderful teacher, and wonderful collaborator. So she'll be up next. Okay. Well, we, we're, we're running short on time, and Monica has some really cool stuff to talk about. So don't be afraid when you see this outline. I'm going to whiz through it, um, if I can even get it to go. Now my, I was all cocky, and now I can't get my slides to advance. There we go. Okay, so this was all the stuff I'm going to talk about, but very quickly. Um, but it really builds on what you've already heard from Andy and Penny. They do this work so well, just intuitively. And then, as Andy mentioned, Penny was in our classes and learned more of the academic side of why we do things the way we do, which I think has helped with what they're doing some. Um, and it certainly drives what I do in my research, which I can tell you about at another time. Um, but it's all based on really just meeting the needs of people where they are. And so that's really what I want to think about as we go forward. So we're going to be talking about all these various things, but it's built on the public health model where we're trying to promote health, but we need to do it in a way that's um, appropriate for the people that we're working with. And so I have a few slides on community engagement. I'm not going to read these slides, but really, as Penny described, it's really important to understand the culture, understand what people's priorities are, and that there are competing priorities before we think we have the solutions. Just as a, a plot spoiler, when we went to Haiti, I was struck by people saying, well, what are your ideas? What are you here to do? And we had no ideas on what to do until we talked with them, and that was new to them. Um, but it's really important to have this community engagement in order to do research that matters to the community and, and to really make a difference that's going to last. When you think about the water filters, okay, what's next? We have to, to find out how people are going to use them and sustain that use. This, I think, probably a lot of you have seen in medical school. It's the epidemiology slide. I thought it was quite relevant because it shows all the things that surround our disease process, the risk factors, and so many of them, as you can see around this picture, are not physiological. There are things in our environment. There are things in our social structure that really affect our risk. Somewhat related to, uh, definitely related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs you see at the bottom, we just have to meet our basic needs. Until then, we can't really be thinking about what's the best way to do this or the best way to do that. We're just trying to survive. And a lot of the people that we work with are in that mode, and we have to remember that. They, can't, they don't have choices and options like many of us do. This is another depiction of the same thing where you have this overarching environment, milieu, that people are living in that we have to understand in order to really help them make behavior change. They have to, to want to make the behavior change before they can actually do it. This is another slide that sort of depicts the same thing, but just thinking about the things that we in the medical field have to think about are what are the, the possibilities for the people we're working with in terms of their options with what they can afford, what they can understand, what environment are they living in, especially if you think about like Malawi and global situations that we've been talking about, and how can we understand policy and regulation, how that's affecting it. Think about Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid expansion right now. Um, system of care. One health I wanted to shout out because I'm in the College of Vet Med um, and it's really especially relevant in global settings because people live in such close proximity to their animals that are pets but roaming around, their livestock, and I've got an example of something related to that later with my last few slides. 
I'm going to skip the health promotion. It's the same kind of thing. We have all these factors involved in trying to do health promotion. Andy asked me to do health behavior theory. That's going to be challenging in a short period of time. So I've got a few examples. Um, and, and just wanted you to kind of think about your own behavior as you're looking at this slide and just think about there are certain things that we all know we should do. I always use the nutrition or the physical activity example. I know I should be active every day. I am not. So obviously the interpersonal is not enough. What are some other factors that might come into play? Um, possibly social support, interaction with other people, um, what's going on with the ecological, environmental, work schedule, that sort of thing. So all these things come into play. So we can't just educate people on what should happen. We have to understand all the other factors related to all the slides that I just was through. So three examples that we have that I teach a whole health behavior theory. Just to kind of illustrate that, the health belief model is really all about internal, like, knowledge, attitudes, that sort of thing. And if you look at these constructs, which I'm not going to read to you, I want you to think about the smoking um, ads that you see on TV, the people who have the, the stomas where they, they have to breathe through and all the just really scare tactics or the texting and driving where suddenly the person's texting and then they're dead. That's health belief model. That's getting your attention, saying this is bad and it can happen to you. That's all about the internal what the person is thinking. Uh, theory of planned behavior takes it a little farther where you can see the, the norms. So do people really, they care about what other people think about and that helps them think, okay, I'm going to do this. So like the exercise example, all right, my neighbor is out running and I can do this too. We're going to run together. So that kind of helps me plan to do that. And the idea is intentions will lead to behavior. Lots of stuff can happen between intentions and behavior as we all know, if you even just think about the activity thing. Um, social cognitive theory is sort of the last one that I'll talk about, and you can just see all these different things that we have and we actually measure when we use social cognitive theory. Big ones being self-efficacy. Does the person really think they can do it? Another big one, self-control. Can they actually make a goal, track it, and, and see if they're actually doing that? But the big thing, as you can see with the arrows, is the interaction between the person and the environment, but their behavior, person, and environment all interact. Best example I've used for that is a recycling education in the schools where the kids come home and they refuse to throw things away so then the parent puts a bin in the house for the recycling. That's an example of that reciprocal determinism where the behavior can actually change the environment but it goes both ways. So the sociological model kind of puts it all in perspective, all the stuff I just babbled about, where you can see the individual, but all the different layers around them that affect their health, affect their health behavior, and we have to consider all of those, especially as we're working with communities and populations to really understand that structure so that we understand how actual change can happen and, and stay over time. So when we're working with communities, as you've heard about in Malawi, and also you'll hear briefly about in Haiti, um, these are the things that matter. I've highlighted the one at the bottom because really all of these other things, the shared mission and goals and the trust and the respect, a lot of it comes down to these words, and it's cultural sensitivity, cultural safety, cultural competence, and I start cultural humility because I want us to think about this as we go into places and and communities that we're not familiar with, a lot of times it's very difficult not to say, oh my gosh, how horrible, or to judge the situation these people are in. That's where they're living and they're doing fine and we have to understand that they might like how they, they live and, and the way they're living is not worse or better necessarily. Maybe their conditions are worse, but, but they have lives that they value and we need to understand that and not make judgment. We just need to get to know them, find out what they do want and help them make those changes. And these things, the, the next slide is just very, very similar. Mutual respect. If we go in and, and we actually listen and we want to hear and we learn from each other, which is what you're going to see with community-based participatory research, that is what really matters. So I have just a couple of slides on CBPR, community-based participatory research. I'd be happy to come back and talk about that some more. But you can see the, the maroon words on these slides about communication and trust and capacity. It's not a fast process. You can't just go in and say, here's my idea of how this is going to work. You have to really get to talk to people, engage stakeholders, as Penny described, and really understand what the situation is and what they want, what, what the people you're working with want to happen. And they have ideas about how it could happen, too. You'd be amazed. Um, and this slide I'm not going over. I just wanted you to see the middle, middle um, circle, maintaining, sustaining, and evaluating partnerships. All the rest is built on that. So if you don't have the partnerships, it's not going to work. And so again, it's not a fast process, it's a very slow process, but it's, it's um, amazingly fulfilling on, for all, all of the people involved. 
And so the guiding principles, again, I'm not going to go over and over all of this stuff because we don't have time right now, but I wanted you to look at number four where it says co-learning and capacity building among all partners. That means both the academic side or the medical side and the communities. So again, we're learning from them probably more than they learn from us, and it's a partnership so that we can, we can all move forward together in a way that's going to be sustainable. That number nine, the long-term process commitment to sustainability, that's a really important part. So why, is, why do we do this if it takes so long? This is a long list of reasons, the advantages, but related to team science, that first one, the diverse expertise, we don't know what we need. We went to Haiti and we didn't really know what we were going to need, what, who we were going to find, who we were going to need to bring to the table, and I have an example of that in just a second here. So here's my Haiti context. I just have four more slides. Um, these are intentional. Here you see the goat, and there's a veterinarian there with a goat, and you can see students that I took back with me last summer. We went to, I've been to Haiti twice now. You can see the little goats. Why are they here? Because when we were in Haiti, what we heard from people is that they wanted their goats to be healthier. And it wasn't because they're pets, and it wasn't because they wanted to eat them. It was because they were worth more at market. That's their bank. That's where their money is right there. So they wanted us to help them know how to have their goats be healthier. I could tell you some funny stuff about that, but I won't. Um, and so what? Um, so I will tell you. I should tell you now. So when I went back to Haiti, I took um, Lauren, who's on the left. She's a veterinary resident at Virginia Tech in clinical nutrition. And Miranda, some of you may know, Miranda Gerard, she is a second-year medical student now, very interested in global health. So because of the One Health aspect, I took the, the medical student and the veterinary resident back to address some of the needs that we heard. This slide I wanted to just put up because it's an example of what I would consider um, related to cultural humility. You can see Andy there with a the backpack. Um, the residents, the community members are so proud of this clinic. They have a clinic. Many people do not have a clinic. So when you walk in, you might say, oh my gosh, how rudimentary. They are so proud of this because they have that clinic in their community. And that's where we need to start is how can we use that clinic um, to even make more difference. And then the last slide that I, or the next to last slide I have here is um, that's a Red Cross van and that's a school in Haiti, and the apron is all their health messages that they have. But what I wanted to talk about is the way they do their health, health education that is amazing. That van drove up to that school. We didn't even know it was coming. And then all the community members showed up, every community member from what we could tell, old, young, man, woman, teenager, little kid, and the presentation was about breastfeeding. And it was skit-based with lots of singing and dancing and laughing, and it was amazing. And so they're using health behavior theory right there to engage the community, community-based and engage in the community with a way that will actually reach them. It was quite amazing. But a funny thing is that apron reminds me that when we were talking to people about how they stay healthy, they talked about eating local. And I was trying to figure out where in the world is this coming from? Because of course they're eating local. It's a message that Red Cross gives, just a standard message. And they heard it and they keep saying it. I'm not sure that they understand the, the context, but that was funny. Um, okay, so here's our team. Just wanted to show the One Health team. You can see me there and Miranda and Lauren. Um, the, the other woman is a doctor from Venezuela who is there living in the community, and the veterinarian there is in the middle. So that's our One Health team, and, and our idea was going back from because of messages that we had heard, and Monica's going to talk to, about other messages, um, to try to address some of the community needs that they had. Okay, as fast as I can go, Monica, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So my presentation actually um, reviews a project that I completed for Dr. Millionaire's class uh, along with two other students in that class. And I really believe that the reason he invited me to be a part of this presentation today was that this WinSAC project is a great example of both interdisciplinary teamwork and community-based participatory research from beginning to end. And so we're going to go all the way back to the beginning where SWENSAC began. Um, in August 2017, um, a group of interdisciplinary faculty and students traveled to Fond du Lac, Haiti, and the mission uh, for their trip was to really explore future projects and to investigate if the team model would work there. Um, and during their time, they met with locals um, and they interviewed seven midwives, which are known as matrones, in Haiti. Um, and during that interview, they, the matrones I, voiced a request for flashlights, 
a poncho, and they really wanted some way of carrying their delivery kits to and from the sites um, to keep them clean and dry during those long walks. Um, and at the time, a backpack was suggested to carry everything. Um, so with that in mind, coming back to Blacksburg and Virginia Tech, Dr. Mielinair approached the industrial design department and proposed um, that undergraduate design students create a prototype backpack that would be specific to the Matron's needs. And then in fall of 2017, um, two senior um, industrial design students, Nicole Norris and Laura Haggerty, uh, picked that up as their thesis project. And their work really involved a lot of extensive community-based participatory research as well as design. Um, and their research gathered um, a lot of information. Um, they interviewed um, midwives um, and individuals who worked in Haiti on the ground. Um, and the information they gathered led them to the design of a new birth attendant kit. So the video I'm going to show you was put together by Nikki and Laura. And this really takes a look at their process and product design. And so I'll let them tell it in their own words. We might uh, we have some slow internet on our end, so okay. we will uh, go ahead and play it, and um, hopefully we can hear it, and pretty soon we'll be able to see it. I'm, okay. I'm hoping. Hmm. Maybe there we go. If you have sound on your end, uh, like a speaker, you might want to uh, direct it to the phone. Oh, okay. Let's see. Sound. <laughs> yeah, we, we hear a little bit of sound. Uh, light music in the background? <laughs> Unless somebody has placed us on hold. We might want to um, we might want to move past the video. I think we're having some lag on our end, so we're kind of stuck on one screen. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> All right. Um, or if you want to narrate for us, kind of what you're uh, what you're hoping we see. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the, this whole process shows how Nikki and Laura um, went through the whole um, design process um, from creating a problem map, um, including prenatal and postnatal care. Um, what the midwives were experiencing, um, and it shows their complete design process and um, their reason for the design. Um, they focused on education for matrons and mothers. That was a key point that they gathered from their research. They needed a transportation of self and goods and facilitation of safe and sterile deliveries. Um, and so we can just move past the video here. All right. Are you seeing the slides? Uh, we're still on the video, but it'll it'll catch up in just a second. So you can you can go ahead. All right. Uh, so fast forward uh, to spring of 2018, um, where the new course entitled Biomedical Engineering and Global Societal Ethics was offered um, at Virginia Tech um, and taught by Dr. Moulinaire and Dr. Christopher Arena. And the course was focused on engineering translational solutions to global health challenges. And included in this class were myself as a student um, studying public health, um, Anna Harris, a fellow public health master's student, and Jenny Huarhua, who is an international development graduate student. 
And so when you get three non-engineering students in a biomedical engineering class who are tasked with choosing a project to focus on for the duration of the, um, the course, uh, we chose the project that was already engineered. <laughs> um, but beyond that, we knew that there was an opportunity to provide SWENSAC to Mitrans and Fonva, and additionally, there was a lot of momentum occurring um, across campus um, um, and across different stakeholders to implement this WINSAC. But as Dr. Hostig had discussed, we didn't want to do this so fast. We wanted to make sure that we could support SWINSAC su success, um, and we wanted to know, measure if it was working, if it was helping midwives, and if it was improving maternal and newborn health um, as in a long term. Um, and our team had the public health and an international development experience um, in order to develop such a plan. So the industrial design students um, addressed the first need. The matrons needed a way to deliver and carry, um, to carry their delivery tools. Um, and we wanted a plan to introduce and implement SWINSAC so that would be accepted by the community um, and the health benefits could be evaluated and maximized. So we did our own research. We held a lot of meeting and interviews um, with individuals from Team Haiti, um, as well as the SWENSAC designers and um, their advisor, uh, Dr. Elham, in the industrial design department. And we utilized the tools that we were learning um, in product design, and this bonefish diagram just um, shows how we brainstormed about um, the criteria we believed would be needed for a successful adoption and implementation of SWENSAC. And we've looked at health behavior theories. So as good public health students, we knew that our implementation plan needed to be informed by health behavior. Um, so we looked at different theories that range from simple to complex, and we married the two. We mashed everything into a decision matrix where we scored each health behavior uh, by the strength of how they addressed our criteria for success, and we chose an intervention um, um, a health behavior theory. And we focused on planning a, for, uh, a, a form of attack. Um, our implementation plan uh, would include a pilot study uh, informed by the dif diffusion of innovation theory, um, and it would be a delayed intervention post-test only to group design. In addition, we created a uh, logic model, and this is really to help us understand the relationship between resources, activities, plan, and our desired results. Um, and here I just wanted to focus on the link between engaging stakeholders um, and the community to, gauging, um, to gaining access um, and participation in activities and adoption of the products and behaviors. Um, and so this is our intervention plan, um, um, I'm sorry, our implementation plan, and we'll go into all the detail, there's a lot of steps, but I really wanted to just highlight how partic uh, community-based participatory research um, is involved in almost every single step of our implementation plan. It starts with preparation and recruitment, where we are focusing on engaging stakeholders, um, matrons, midwives, uh, backpack manufacturers, um, the program and product design team, design team as well as Team Haiti. And so our team um, members for this pilot program would be interdisciplinary. Um, Midwives for Haiti would be an essential on the ground stakeholder for this evaluation, and that's because in the second phase of recruitment, uh, we wanted to make sure we were able to contact matrons and they were gonna be um, key in order to reaching um, the midwives. Um, when we introduce WINSWAC, we want to make sure that we're getting feedback from matrons initially. Um, and so they will get to hold the bags, get to voice their opinions, um, and give feedback um, immediately. And as we move on um, into a one-month follow-up um, and we collect information, um, we are focusing on maternal surveys that are distributed, um, that are provided by the matrons, they'll be trained in that process, and we're also going to be completing focus groups and interviews um, with matrons. At six-month follow-up, same thing, we're having guided discussions with matrons um, to get their feedback about the SWENSAC design um, and to see if they're actually utilizing the SWENSAC and it's meeting their needs. 
And most importantly, I want to make sure that you note know, that we, we circle back in our implementation and evaluation plan, that we make sure to disseminate the findings at the end of the intervention to stakeholders and participants so that they have that information. And I'm just going to note a couple of things that um, future implications and possibilities for participatory research as well. Um, the SWENSEC includes a surface tray um, that's designed to pack up easily. It's made of ripstop nylon and is supposed to be wipe clean and water resistant. And some of the concerns we had with that were the availability of cleaning products and cleaning um, processes um, in Fondwa. Um, in addition to the possibility of cross-contamination um, and just infection control. So we looked at cleaning instructions. Bleach is um, mo the most readily available, likely the most readily available product for cleaning there. And so we created cleaning instructions with steps for um, maintaining the, the cleanliness of this tray. Um, and that raised a lot of questions. Uh, there was a lot of concerns and limitations. Um, and so this could be a potential research um, project for someone ahead. And lastly, um, one of the other goals for this project was creating a sustainable, economical pro um, program within Haiti. And so, in there not covering it. And so. Um, we looked at the cost of developing the backpack itself, the prototype backpack, and um, our international de um, development student um, was looking into the feasibility of having the backpack produced in Haiti um, so that it would improve an ec economic development. And so she went through a detailed budget, which I won't go through in the time. And just quickly, the future implications. Quality control testing for infectious uh, pathogen transmission and material integrity should be performed on the surface tray. Um, as updates are made for this SWENSAC and its contents, we want to continue the further evaluation. As we get feedback from the Matuans and the mothers, we want to adjust our, um, the product accordingly. Um, and the future directions for SWENSAC should include working with stakeholders in Fondwa to produce the pack sustainably in Haley and sell it to midwives to stimulate the local economy. And ultimately, if the evaluation finds that SWENSAC impacted health positive, positively, then stakeholders could consider introducing the delivery system um, to other developing countries um, with similar health challenges. And just a list of credits there, and that really concludes my presentation. Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. We. Uh, have run over a little bit between yeah. our uh, a little bit of a late start uh, due to the weather. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. Uh, we won't have time for questions, but you can certainly email me or others uh, if you have questions. Um, and uh, just wanted to, again, emphasize that uh, we, we've covered a lot of stuff, but um, uh, there is there are lots of opportunities for students, residents, faculty to uh, be involved in in some of the things we do um, with, with Team Malawi, Team Haiti, uh, but other other activities uh, here in the community. We um, uh, community-based participatory research will be the basis of our project that we're working on for. Uh, healthcare at Fallon Park Elementary School, um, among other projects. And again, uh, Dr. Dunsmore is not here today, but what, what generated a lot of this was uh, uh, my first conversation with her where she said, we're going to do some team science. And I said, okay. And then I had to go back and look it up and figure out, uh, uh, only to realize we've been doing a lot of team science uh, already. And um, we, uh, or just being a little more formal about it. I want to thank uh, Kathy Hosick uh, and Monica for joining us uh, remotely today. It was quite a challenge. Uh, we uh, contemplated cancellation, but uh, wanted to be here for our potential residents. And welcome again. And for those faculty who managed to get here, hopefully you'll get home safely. Thanks a lot.